and welcome to Weather Geeks. I'm Dr. Marshall Shepard from the University of Georgia, and we have a very fascinating show today. I'm joined by Chief Meteorologist from Surfline, Mark Willis, and this is a really interesting show because we're going to be talking about the science of wave forecasting, the implications of that for surf competitions, and also the importance of wave forecasting, perhaps as it relates to things like Hurricane Matthew that we just saw this year. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having First me. First of all, tell us a little bit about Surfline. We were talking off camera, and you said you have a staff of about 80 people. What are you What are you doing in Surfline? Yeah, the last I checked, we had about 80 people. Yeah. But uh, Surfline's, believe it or not, been around for 31 years. We oh, wow. were founded in 1985 by Sean Collins. Um, and uh, our mission is to make surfers' lives better, and we do that a number of waves, a uh, number of ways, uh, no pun intended. Yeah, there. <laughs> I was going to say, you got waves um, on your mind. <laughs> um, first and foremost, we issue human value-added forecast 365 days a year all over the world. Um, another way we make surfers' lives better is we've got uh, our own proprietary wave modeling system known as Lola um, that's designed specifically with surfers in mind. Um, we also have high-definition webcams all over the world so surfers can see what the waves look like before they go to the beach. And then last but not least is we have industry-leading uh, surf editorial content that ranges from anything from who won the latest surf competitions to a wetsuit buyer guide for the upcoming winter to real-time photos and video of uh, real-time swells going on around the world. Yeah, and I'm gonna, we're gonna, in the, later in the segment, we're gonna talk about those webcams a little bit in terms of how they were used, not only even for surfing, but things like uh, monitoring storms. I know I was all over your Surfline webcams during Hurricane Matthew and some of the other storms, but tell us a little about, a bit about the innovation behind those webcams. I mean, how do they work? I mean, because I, mean, I think this is one of the things that many weather geeks uh, really know you for. Yeah, I mean, we've got a lot of proprietary stuff that goes into oh, our webcams. Oh, you can't tell us. <laughs> but tell us but, what you uh, can. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we install webcams at anywhere you can imagine to view the surf. I mean, we specifically put them at great surf spots around the world. So, again, people know uh, know what the waves are like before they go. Yeah. Um, and, we, you know, we've got... They're all high definition, we're moving to 4K, and uh, uh, yeah, we've got webcams all over the place. Now, give us a little insight, this is the weather geeks, and we have a very meteorologically savvy audience and a curious audience out there. Give us a little insight as a meteorologist. I know you uh, meteorologist trained at Florida State and the University of Hawaii with your bachelor's and master's degrees. Give us a little insight into the meteorology of wave forecasting. Yeah, wave forecasting can be humbling at times because there's not a lot of observations over the ocean, um, but uh, it all starts with observations like anything else. I mean, if you don't know what's going on right now, you're not gonna be able to predict the future. Uh, observations for us range from buoy data um, you know, that measure waves um, you know, at specific locations, fixed locations around the world, um, satellite data, satellite altimeters that measure wave height data that helps us interrogate the models um, where the buoys often miss. So you satellite data sets perhaps from NOAA or even NASA are very valuable for your operations. Incredibly valuable for us to interrogate model data and determine when the models are incorrect okay. so we can add value to our forecast. What about, are there any models that you particularly, I, mean, I, I suspect you use the typical weather models we all look at, European, GFS, but are there any specific wave type models or specific models? Absolutely. Um, we run a version of the WaveWatch 3 model um, that NOAA developed. Um, Hendrik Tolman is the author of that. Uh, we have some tweaks that we do to it. We simulate data into it, and uh, the output is specifically designed for surfers. So, yeah, we've got our own proprietary modeling system. We run global models, regional models, and then very local nearshore models that go to hundreds of meters of resolution. Now, I want to come back to sort of some of the geeky science of wave <clears throat> forecasting. There's a term called wave period. Mm -hmm. What is that, and why does it matter? The easy answer is wave period is the time it takes two successive wave crests or troughs to pass a, a particular point like a buoy. Um, but the more complicated answer is wave period is related to a, a lot of things. It is related to how fast a wave moves, it's related to how much energy waves have, and then ultimately uh, how big the surf can be. So wave period is directly related to surf height as well. So, you know, this sort of periodicity or wave period is no different than what we might have learned in a high school physics course about waves in terms of period and frequency and amplitude of waves in some it's, regards. It's very similar, yeah. and uh, we look at wave period as kind of the X factor. I mean, it's um, wave height is just one thing, wave direction is another, but you really need to get the wave period correct uh, to pr accurately predict surf. Well, tell me a little bit about how you measure wave height. Um, wave height and open ocean is pretty easy because you've got buoys and satellites like we talked about before. But, but, but let me stop you there because I think people are intuitive in terms of how you measure wave height with buoys. 
How are you measuring wave height with uh, satellites? Is it altimetry, uh, it's, lasers? It's altimetry. Okay, um, and, and explain that concept a little bit because our viewers may not be familiar. It, with. It's an active measurement where the satellite sends a beam down and the information that comes back tells us basically how big the waves are. Um, that's one part. The other part is surf height, which we don't have a lot of observations for. Breaking waves is much different than waves in the open ocean. And that's where things get a little more challenging and oftentimes qualitative. Um, we've got spotters around the world to basically tell us basically what they think the surf is doing, and we train them to look at waves a particular way. Interesting. Now, um, you, you mentioned that you forecast, and uh, in the next segment, we're going to talk about the pressure of forecasting for some of these big surf events. But is there a place in the United States that is particularly challenging? Gosh, you know, everywhere has got its challenges, but if I had to pick one place, I actually would say South Florida, because really? South Florida's got the Bahamas offshore that breaks up a lot of incoming swell, but it's got a couple little gaps in there that can allow swell to come through and reach a particular stretch of coastline. And it's also got the Gulf Stream that does some interesting things to waves. Um, you know, South Florida is the only place in the world where you can get offshore winds um, and actually get surf because of the way it interacts with the Gulf Stream. Yeah, and, and just uh, for the we our Weather Geeks viewers, the Gulf Stream is that sort of warm, poleward moving current that many of us are familiar with off the east coast of the United States. That's yeah. correct. Now, what about the sort of concept of a three-foot wave or three-foot wave out in the open ocean? How does that eventually become a 12-foot wave at the beach? A lot of that's because of wave period, because wave period is directly related to how deep a swell or wave extends into the ocean. So if you've got a very long period wave, like a 20 second wave can extend about a thousand feet into the ocean, um, where a short period wave doesn't extend nearly as deep into the ocean. So as that very long period wave, three foot wave comes in, interacts with the sea floor, it bends and it grows and it focuses on reefs and all kinds of fun things underneath the sea floor and then it grows and essentially you can turn a three foot wave into a 12 foot wave because of wave period and how it focuses waves on particular parts of the coastline. Right, now this is, we're just getting started down here on Weather Geeks, but next the pressure's on. I mean, they forecast for some <laughs> of the largest, most important surf competitions in the world. We're gonna put them on the spot and ask about that, but first, our Geek of the Week. This week's Geek of the Week is professional surfer Sam Hammer. Sam has been crushing it along the Jersey Shore for 20 years and loves nor'easters. And while he really loves the swells that giant storms produce, Sam is comfortable if monster storms like the perfect storm in Sandy stay way out over the ocean. Congratulations to Sam Hammer, our Geek of the Week. And we're back on Weather Geeks, and we're talking all about wave forecasting and surf. And Surfline is our guest here, and you guys are the official forecaster for the World Surf League 11 tour stops, as well as the Big Wave Tournament. I mean, a lot of people may not realize the, the intricacies of what is involved there. Tell us about the role of meteorologists there. First of all, it's, it's very stressful um, <laughs> because we're putting our, our name out there in front of the, literally the entire surfing world. But it's, it's something we take incredibly seriously. It's a major operation and we're very proud of it. But the way it works is, uh, as you mentioned, there's 11 world tour stops um, that the World Championship Tour part of the WSL has. And the world's best surfers travel to these spots around the world. And they've got about a 10 day window to run an event. And we have to help the contest organizers pick the best three to five day window where the waves are going to be the best because we want to put the world's best surfers in okay, the world's so best waves. Okay, so let me just make sure Weather Geeks viewers got, got that because you said there's a 10 day window and then you as a forecaster have to identify the optimized or optimal three day window in that period? Three to five days. Three it to depends five. On, yeah, it depends on the event, but, uh, but yeah, that's right. What if you bust? Uh, then there's a lot of money wasted. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, these events take a, a lot of money to, to put on, but uh, we try to minimize the bus factor. Yeah, but are there any particularly memorable success stories that you have? Um, you know, one thing that comes to mind is the, uh, um, in 2012, I believe it was, we were the official forecasters for the, uh, the event at Snapper Rocks in Australia and the Gold Coast of Australia. Um, and I specifically remember they had to actually extend the waiting period because there's just no waves. It was flat. They couldn't run an event. Right. Um, and the, the GFS, which happens to be the same model that runs a lot of the major wave models you see out there, was spinning up a, a cyclone, which eventually turned into Cyclone Pam, and it was going to generate a significant easterly swell for the Gold Coast. 
Um, turns out that didn't happen, um, and the, they extended the waiting period, but they got some waves, but it wasn't the cyclone swell that a lot of the models were uh, suggesting were going to happen. Sure. So we had to mitigate and, and kind of you know, bring down the expectations of that a little bit. Um, and that was one that will, I'll always remember is when they had to extend the waiting period at Snapper Rocks. Wow. Now, you know, I think many people, and I know when I visited uh, Hawaii, we went up to the North Shore and all of that, I think it's very well known for its waves. Why is it that that particular region is so well known for its waves? Hawaii sits at literally the perfect latitude and longitude to be a, essentially a catcher's mitt for wintertime swells from the North Pacific storm track in the winter. Um, but it's not just uh, wintertime storms that produce waves in Hawaii. They get southern hemisphere swells from storms that come off New Zealand and take roughly five to eight days to arrive on the south shore of Hawaii. They can get west swells from typhoons off of Japan, and then they get obviously trade swell events and hurricane swell events on the windward sides of Hawaii. But it's the north shore that everybody thinks about, um, and on Oahu in particular, from Haleiwa to Sunset Beach is known as the Seven Mile Miracle. There's about 36 world-class surf destinations that are facing west-northwest right into the storm track of the North Pacific. Um, and it also, it, because it faces west-northwest, the predominant east-northeast trade winds blow offshore, which produces very clean waves. So that's a couple of reasons why yeah, Hawaii so is so special. Quite a bit of meteorology. In 20 seconds or so, what are some other places, if Hawaii is sort of kind of the king of the hill there, what are some other good big wave locations around the world? Oh, geez, there's, there's several. Mavericks, yeah, come, Mavericks comes to mind in Northern California, and then Nazare off the coast of Portugal. They've got the underwater Nazare Canyon that allows waves to focus off the coast of Portugal, and that's one of the more phenomenal big wave spots in the world for sure. Wow. Now, I mean, we, we're just getting started here with the weather geek aspect of this uh, show. Hurricane Matthew, we, we saw that this year. Surfline and their cameras were a big part of that. I bet you were viewing some of it. When we get back, we're going to talk about Surfline's role in monitoring hurricanes like Matthew, next on Weather Geeks. And we're back on Weather Geeks and we're talking about waves. And I want to pivot the discussion a little bit and talk about how your role changed at Surfline during Hurricane Matthew. Yeah, so Hurricane Matthew is one of those times where surfing kind of took a back seat to helping the media, uh, people become informed of what was going on and really help, you know, the nation become weather ready and, uh, and just help in our, you know, everybody protect life and property. So we've got a lot of assets that we think are very valuable to the meteorological community and the media. For example, webcams obviously is one that comes up. We syndicate webcams to news networks all around the world so people can see storm including surge. Including the Weather Channel? I know including the Weather sure. Channel. and Yeah, absolutely the Weather Channel. But we also, as we mentioned before, we've got a lot of wave models. We've got a lot of uh, proprietary forecasts that we think are very valuable to the meteorological community. Now, you were telling me that you even looked up and saw your, one of your webcams by, uh, behind President Obama at the White House? Yeah, that was a pretty special moment for Surfline. Um, I, I don't remember what news network it was, but you had President Obama giving a briefing on the threats associated with Hurricane Matthew, and then adjacent to him was one of our uh, Surfline webcams. I think it was the Daytona Beach Cam, but um, yeah, pretty special moment for yeah, Surfline. Yeah, so that should tell you Weather Geeks viewers how the credibility of their product there if the president's using it. Now, do you forecast storm surge as well, or just you stick to waves? We don't um, specifically forecast storm surge. I mean, you can obviously observe storm surge with our cams. Um, we do have a relationship with the National Weather Service and also the USGS on a couple of storm surge projects. Uh, specifically related to wave run-up, um, but we don't actively uh, produce storm surge forecasts. Now, when, it, when I think about a storm like Matthew, and I looked at some of the damage in, say, Flagler County you know, along the, the, the Atlantic Highway there, uh, there was damage, and some of that had to be wave damage, right, not storm. storm damage. Do we undersell or underestimate just general wave damage in these storms and our focus on the storm surge, which we definitely should focus on? I think you're 100% correct. There is a uh, absolutely, undoubtedly, a lot of impact from waves during Matthew, and um, there's two kind of mechanisms that uh, waves contribute to the total water level. Uh, that's wave setup and wave runup. Um, wave setup is just the still water level that uh, water rises after waves continuously break, and then the dynamic part, wave runup, after waves break, they run up the coast, and absolutely, that can be very damaging. Now, I, one of the things that I find, and I talk about this myself, I think the public still 
sort of struggles with the concept of the difference between a wave and the storm surge. Uh, any clever ways that you all have come up with to kind of convey the threat of a surge versus a wave in an event like this, or do you struggle with it as much as all of us? It's tough. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, it's on us as meteorologists to look at the total picture. I mean, total water level, not just the surge part, not just the wave part, but right. everything. Uh, from tide to wind-driven storm surge to the waves. I mean, it's it's all incredibly important. Yeah. Now I want to pivot. To, uh, we're entering the winter season. Uh, some winter storms are going to start to be prevalent in the the jargon. Nor'easters. How do they affect waves? Well, it depends where the nor'easter is located. But uh, what surfers look for is a nor'easter, like on the east coast, for example, something that's offshore. So you're not getting the winds and the weather, you're just getting the swell from it. Um, and yeah, you're, you're right, this is the time of year we look to nor'easters. Um, in the North Pacific, you know, we've got wintertime storms that are tracking through from Japan to the Gulf of Alaska, and that's what generates all the big waves for Hawaii and the West Coast. Um, so yeah, it's a very exciting part of the year to be in the Northern Hemisphere for surfers. Now, 20 seconds or so, I know a lot of surfers in storms like to go out and catch some waves, as they say. Do you worry about that from a safety standpoint? <laughs> 20 seconds. Um, that's up to the surfer. I mean, they should know their limits for sure. Yeah. Um, but you're right, I mean, storms can produce good waves. Um, we talked about hurricanes, Hurricane Matthew, even though surfing took a back seat, Matthew produced incredible surfing waves for a couple of locations. One of them that comes to mind is South Beach, Florida, which doesn't get a lot of waves. Um, Matthew took a track um, you know, in between the Bahamas and South Florida to where it, it, it produced a very good swell and offshore winds, which is what you want. Right. That's where we're going to have to end it. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, another fascinating episode of Weather Geeks. We're here every Sunday at noon. You can find us on Twitter at WXGeeksTWC, and we're on Facebook as well. See you next week on Weather Geeks.